Thanks for tuning in to the Stained Arrow Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Pennycuff, and our other host is Dalton Owenby. Just two former college football players and men of faith that love our families and have a huge passion for hunting and fishing in the outdoors. talk about on uh, today's episode is uh, part of our preparation uh, for going elk hunting in 2022 season and uh, what, we, what we can take from the last time when we hunting la- went hunting last year in 20 uh, was it 2020 and we're gonna take the good the bad and the straight up ugly from last year and uh, apply that to our 2022 hunt uh, so Dalton, what's some of the some of the good things that you can take from from the hunt we went on last year, the elk hunt we went on last year? I feel like honestly, with it being with it being our first time, you know, going in, obviously you can do your you can do your homework as much as you you know want to, and you you feel like you've got a really good game plan, but there's nothing that compares to actually getting out there when, when yeah, you the- finally get there. It, it's a totally different world you know it's it's just completely different than what you think it's going to be in your mind yeah them boots on the ground really changes things if you've never been somewhere and you put boots on the ground it's it can be quite a bit different Absolutely. i don't think tasks sometimes like uh, when we first got to aspen and i was like i don't know about this one yeah that some of that stuff in aspen i mean you know you know it's going to be steep and and, you know, we're we're lucky, you know, here in East Tennessee, you know, we, we have mountains and stuff. So you, you think, you know, you get used to living here in the mountains and you think, OK, you know, it's not going to be that bad. Well, you know, the highest the highest point in East Tennessee is 6000 feet at Clingman's Dome. You know, you get out here in Colorado and you start at 6000 feet and, yeah. and then just keep climbing. You know, everything's just an uphill battle out there. And that's really I mean, about how I would summarize how our first our first hunt went in Colorado was just an uphill battle the whole time. Yeah, we uh I think we were consistently between 11,000 and 13,000 feet out there. But yeah, that that first day when we was driving in when we got to the trailhead and that big bull was on the other side, I re- I was really excited and had high hopes. Um but that first that initial push in it uh, it really put a hurting on me. I remember getting up to about where we was going to camp, and I don't know if you remember, but, man, I just started feeling sick, and it put a hurting on me pretty bad. You remember me just laying down in that meadow, like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. <laughs> yeah, and, and see, that's another that's another thing that I think that we'll learn from next time. Um, we, we had a pretty tough hike in, and we knew it was going to be a tough hike in either way. But I think one of the one of the main problems that we created for ourselves is we were so anxious and so excited just to be there and to get to our target destination to where we wanted to set our base camp up at. I think that we pushed it a little more than we should have, you know, because we, yeah. we weren't very rushed. We could have we could have stopped more and, you know, just took our time. And I think we really kind of rushed getting into our spot. And yeah, I, and I, think I we pushed it too hard. Another thing is, you know, I, I think that we, when we pulled in, we saw other hunters, and that made us want to push even harder to get yeah. in front of them. But in reality, when you go to Colorado, you know, there's there's people there's people coming from all over the world to go and hunt out there, and you know, you're not gonna go unless you get a you know a, a really really high up you know, draw hunt out there, you're not going to go hunt OTC on public land out there and not encounter other hunters. And I think we'll know that going forwards. Yeah, I don't think it's, uh, honestly, the mother hunters, they can help and they can hurt you. I think Uh, just how how you use the other hunters to your advantage. 
Um, so like going into that, going into this hunt next year in 2022, what, uh, what, what's our preparation going to be like? What do we need to, to do in preparation, uh, as, as a, I guess, mental, physical and determination aspect? Well, I I think one thing is, I, I really think that we've got the first one under our belt. So we, we know what to expect now. And I feel like we just need to get started a little bit ahead of time. I felt like we did a a really good job of strategizing and figuring out, you know, where we needed to go. And even when our initial plan didn't work out, we relocated and did the research that night and figured out kind of where we wanted to go. I, I think more than anything, what I can't stress enough is, don't get started too late with your preparation, not even just physically or mentally more so than anything. I think you need to start preparing your equipment and getting all your resources together early because next thing you know, it's on you and you're scrambling and wondering, well, do I have this or do I have this? You know, when you're loading, when you're loading the, the vehicle up to head out there, you're thinking, well, do I have this or do I have that? And the last thing you want to be worrying about when you're trying to leave or trying to drive out there, you're trying to enjoy yourself and, you know, enjoy the views that you've never seen before. You don't want to be stressed out, you know, wondering if you forgot something. You know, I really think you need to prepare everything in advance. Yeah. And, you know, physically, you know, what I do for a living, you know, it's very physically demanding and, you know, a lot of people, you know, can't say that, but I think that helped me prepare a little bit mentally because I know every day when I go to work that it's not going to be an easy day. And I think that helped me keep pushing through. Yeah. The kind of work you do every day, that's a, that's a grind. That's mental preparation. But I I think another big thing though, once you actually, you know, get out there, the the camaraderie, you have to keep you have to keep the camaraderie between, you know, you and whoever you're hunting with. You have to keep each other's morale up. And I think that really is a big thing that that helped us while we were out there because we were both struggling initially and you know, we we just kind of kept grinding it out. We just kept telling each other, you know, just to grind, just to grind and just keep going. So I think we need to carry that on into this coming up season just try to you know make sure that make sure that both of us are are prepared and just try to you know really look out for each other and make sure that we're ready for it this time yeah uh for myself i think uh a really important part for me will be my my physical preparation um i know we're still a year out from when we're going to be going but uh i've already started i'm probably I don't know, eight weeks into working out and trying to lose weight. So I think that aspect of of my preparation will play a big part in me and us hunting in Colorado because I'll be uh, better in shape. I'll be able to <clears throat> like grind for for I guess the lack of a better terms is grind it out. You know. Yeah, I mean I agree with that. You've definitely got the jump on me on that aspect of it. And, you know, there's no there's no substitute for being in in good physical shape out there. I mean, you know, you can hear people say it over and over again that you have to really be prepared to go out there and hunt elk. You know, one of one of my favorite people to listen to is uh, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan yeah. is an avid hunter and um, you know a, a sportsman in general, and he he's always maintained that hunting elk is one of the hardest things in life to do and after after you know doing it firsthand i I truly believe that and i think i think there's no substitute for being physically prepared to do it you can be mentally tough and at times i think that was one of the only things that got me through it because i was just i was just you know raised this to be a strong-willed you know you know person and but your body can only do so much if you're not you know physically 
in shape to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. That first night about got altitude sickness and it about knocked, it about put me down. Uh, honestly, I think I was about to pass out, but you know, we kind of pushed through a little bit and slept through that, that first night and it was decent after that. I mean, it was still tough on us, but you know, right. yeah, it was, I think another thing, honestly, that hurt us with our preparation, I think that we probably packed in pretty heavy compared uh, to what most people would pack in because yeah, and, we were anticipating a, a, a longer, you know, stay in the woods. And I think that that actually kind of took a little bit of wind out of us right off the bat because we packed in so heavy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I think that's kind of a double edged sword too, because, um, I think we could have used a little better equipment on the, on the hike in, uh, especially for you. Um, that, that gear that I had that you were using probably wasn't the, the best. And I'm sure that took a toll on you physically on your back and everything. I mean, I had, you know, my, my mountain backpack, my, uh, Alps backpack, and it's, it's a, you know, hunting, hiking backpack, like, uh, backcountry backpack. And, um, honestly that backpack, even I was even hurting pretty good. So I think honestly, uh, the investment in some pretty good equipment to go out there and hunt is, is another key factor in, in the physical side. Yeah, absolutely. You're only as good as your equipment. No yeah. Doubt. Yep. Um, and as far as, you know, the scouting side of our preparation, um, Obviously, me and you, we set up probably, I don't know, two or three hours looking at maps the other night. <laughs> yeah, at least. Uh, honestly, I got so in, I got so into to the scouting aspect of it and and looking at stuff on Onyx. Uh, I honestly lost track of time. Uh, I didn't even realize what time it was because we had got so into it. And you know, that's that's another thing. You can never, you, you can look at a spot until you're blue in the face and think it's a perfect spot, but you can never have too many spots. It's, you know, it's, it's no different than hunting any other animal in the world. You have, you can try to pattern them, but that pattern doesn't always work. You know, we're, we're so used to hunting whitetail and, you know, to a certain extent you can, you can pattern a whitetail, but as soon as you think you've got it down, they're not there so you can never yeah. spend too much time looking over your maps and stuff and, and finding multiple you know waypoints and places if if something doesn't pan out to where we can you know pack up and head to the next spot yeah i, de I definitely think that having a plan b uh, c and d e f g h i you know having those backup plan really um, honestly, I'm glad that we got the opportunity, uh, when we originally went down to Colorado and we were going to hunt around Aspen that we, we kicked, we took it, we took a step back. We didn't have that plan, but we took a step back, took that night to plan what our plan B was, was going to be when we should have already had a plan B, but, but we went ahead and executed it anyways. And, um, in executing that plan, we saw we didn't necessarily get to hunt that bull, but we saw a bull and whatever it was, forty cows, something like that. Yeah, I so. mean, I, I think that was I think that was one of our problems, but I also think, like you said, that it was something that really helped us because we went in guns blazing right off the bat. We were so excited to be there. We we had this vision in our head yeah, that yeah. we were going to drive right in there and make it happen and yeah. you know that's that's great you can never have you can never have too much confidence yeah that enthusiasm and confidence goes a long way i think but you know it was it was also helped us because once we realized that that wasn't going to pan out it did it helped us regroup and take a step back you know and and reassess what we needed to to you know learn from our first stop and you know, we, we went into our second spot and I feel like we had a really good game plan going into going into our second spot. And 
you know, it, it didn't quite work out, but you know, like you said, we were, we were on elk, we were around elk and, you know, I feel like, I feel like there was a few things that we could have did a little different. I, I do still feel like we didn't spend enough time glassing. You yeah. Know, but also with that being said, we were, the location we were in wasn't ideal for glassing. We needed to push in and up the mountain before we could start glassing. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, looking back, there was a lot of opportunity. I think that we missed out because we didn't really hunt the northern part of that unit where there was a lot more meadows and stuff. I think looking back, I think if we would have went to the northern part of that unit, we might have been more successful because uh, I was looking at the maps the other day and to the northwest part of where we were at was a lot of. I mean, it was a lot of more open country. We might have had to, to you know, in, uh, go up the mountain a couple thousand feet in elevation, but we could have looked down onto some of those meadows, and I think it would have been beneficial to, to the objective. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, you know, another thing that we haven't really talked about yet is our access points. We, we found this access point. And it was a very good, you know, access point. It was a great place, but that was another thing that we didn't have a plan, you know, A or B or C. We found that access point and basically made that our only access point. Yeah, and that was and, it, yeah. And that was another thing, you know. I, that I think possibly, that was a mistake. I, I, I think it was too, honestly. And, you know... Who, who's to say that we, you know, could have done, you know, differently if we had found another one. But I think one of the main things that we've learned is you have to have a backup plan for locations, for access points, for a lot of a lot of different things. You have to be prepared for different, um, you know, parts of parts of the woods out there. In parts of the mountains, you know, everything's different. You know, we we went from Aspen where, you know, our spots were straight up and straight down the mountain. And then, you know, we moved over to us and it was more of just a grueling, gradual climb the whole way up that mountain. And I feel like if we could have maybe found another access point that would have gave us, you know, a different angle on the mountain or maybe put us a little bit closer or, you know, just, just anything that we could have done just to make it a little bit easier on ourselves, you know, right off the get. I think yeah. it would have gave us more confidence. Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. Um, but as for this time, um, I think you're wanting to go to the, uh, the opposite direction. Um, and hunt down there, um, which is good. And I think there's a little more opportunity for glassing and, and uh, things like that down there. Um, as far as tac- tactics go, I think uh, I think that we both need to probably get a little better at our calling and stuff. Oh, yeah. That w- that way um, we can set a hunter maybe fifty. 50 or 60 yards in front of the caller that way we can call if we if we get on bulls that are vocal we can pull them in a little closer to the shooter right yeah i I totally agree with that and and that's another thing that's really good about us we we have such good you know brotherhood i guess is what you would would like to call it We're, we're, we're not selfish at all in in any given situation ever we're not worried you know about about our own selves we're we're worried about making it happen for each other and that's that's one of the things that you know you can't you can't prepare for that kind of stuff if you don't have the chemistry with the person you're doing it with and that's yeah. that's a thing that's really going to help us in the long run as we you know continue getting further into this into the elk and stuff but uh i just think that you know once we once we, you know, get better at at what we're doing 
um, I think that it'll start coming to us a lot more naturally because we already have that that chemistry, you know, as a team. Yeah, yeah. Go from years of playing football in college and then years spent together hunting, friendship, bonding. There's nothing. There's nothing in the world better than that. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. Uh, as far as some other tactics that I'd like to to look at to well to apply to this hunt going into next year is I want to try to find some some burns to where the forest is burnt and uh, I was listening to some people talk the other day on a different podcast and I can't remember which one it was or I was watching a go hunt uh, one of the go hunt videos and he was talking about uh, the age of burns that are really effective for elk and he was saying anywhere from two to six years uh, because that grass starts really growing in green and uh, some of the stuff that I've read and uh, listened to about elk is they really like, um, like they're really picky about what they eat. They like that really good vegetation, that uh, highly palatable stuff that's high in protein. So like if you can find them patches of really green grass, uh, if it looks good to you, it probably looks good to the elk. Yeah. I mean, that's, and you know, let's see, that's, that's the kind of thing that gets, that gets you excited because, you know, here in Tennessee, you know, back to, back to hunting whitetails, you know, some of the, some of the best things that you can hunt, you know, that people, a lot of people are scared of. And it really makes me think about it now that you mentioned it, you know, people get so scared when logging companies come in and log their properties because they think it's going to run all the deer off. But in reality, or, or a fire or anything, they think that it's going to, you know, really affect the the herd. And in reality, it actually helps the, know, new, that, the majority of the time. Yeah, that regenerative, regenerative growth really will really pull animals in. It's really good. It's really good for the environment. It, it, it makes the it gives the environment a chance to, to really like regrow what was there before. Right. Yeah, I mean it's it's basically just it's a breath of fresh air for yeah. for an area. Yeah. I think another thing that uh we really need to and this will be you know something that we have to do on Onyx or or and Google Maps because I use Onyx and Google Maps both um is really is kind of look for those north facing slopes because at that time of the year um they'll go to those slopes. Um, during the day and stuff when it when it gets hot they'll be in that thick that thicker uh vegetation them uh and I, i'm not sure the area i know the area that we're going to has those pines and aspen trees and stuff but the thicker it is um during the middle of the day and stuff is it'll be better because it's darker and it's cooler up under them trees than it is on them uh slopes with with meadows and stuff that's getting beat down by the sun Right. And the the temperature swings there are uh, so dramatic. Like, you know, here, you know, a twenty degree temperature change is uh, probably unlikely until you know you get later in the fall. But you know, right. we went there at the first part of September and we was getting thirty, almost forty degree temperature swings within. Oh yeah, it was you know, it was insane. You know that. I know the first day when we when we packed in, it was uh, 70, 75 degrees that day, I believe, and it got down into the low the low thirties. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think we was right at like eighty degrees, and then the next morning it was like twenty nine. Yeah, it was it was pretty insane, and you know, like those those north facing slopes also, you know, it they're generally speaking more wind blown, so not only does it give you know them cover it also allows them to have a a sense of what's below them you know with everything pushing up into their faces they have security there it really gives them security yeah 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 i think uh i think uh uh, another tactic that we need to do is is really and i know a lot of people talk about this and this is something i i I've thought about and I've really wanted to, to uh, use it, but I haven't been elk hunting enough to actually implement it. But like 
using the thermals to my advantage. And I have any, I don't have enough experience actually being on elk to use thermals to my advantage right. or, or, you know, you to stay out of where elk are going to smell us. Right. I know. I don't know if you watched that uh, last episode of the uh, elk hunting series with the hunting public where Aaron and Ted were in there um, with bulls all around them, but they were right on top of these bulls and they never, I mean, they never winded them because they were, they were in the thermals, you know, they were in the right, the right place at the right time. And he killed that, that giant bull. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's super, that's super important, you know, as in, and that's the thing, like you said, you know, there, there's some things that only experience can help. And, you know, we're, we're not very deep, you know, in, into this yet. We're, you know, we're, we're learning, we're learning every day, but like you said, there's no substitute for having boots on the ground and that's just things that you have to learn in real time. You know, there's only so much that you can gain when you're not actually there in person. Yeah. I feel like we've done a really good job of, of gaining knowledge as much as we can, you know, back home where we're at, but, you know, get, getting in on a mature animal. I mean, it doesn't matter a a mature animal anywhere, no matter what species it is, is a mature animal. They've made it that long for a reason. They're extremely intelligent, you know, and, I feel like, you know, it's, you know, when you think about it, that's why the Native Americans were such great hunters. They were so far ahead of their time because they understood the animals so well and and knew exactly what they were. They had, they honestly had mastered the craft of providing, you know, for themselves. And I think that'll... Yeah, because, well, for them, the situation was you know eat or die so right you know they they had to they had to be good at it um but you know you think about these animals and uh especially more mature uh animals with age on them you know they're they're living and dying by their nose so you know they, they're basically rabbits with antlers they're right. they're ra- they're rabbits that can smell better but yeah, and I mean that's the thing, you know. We'll we'll learn as we go, you know, and and get get onto more bulls and you know or cows. We'll we'll figure out, you know, if there's a time, you know, as bad as you know, you see a bull in person, you know, you think you just want to go in, you know, gung ho, and you <laughs> think you're gonna be able to make it happen, but sometimes you just have to, yeah, to come back down to reality and realize that you might <laughs> have to back out and live and you know and live to fight another day and you know regroup and you know try to try to stay on them and you know come up with a different a different strategy for the next day yeah i was literally just about to say that <laughs> uh reality versus expectation sometimes is a little is a little different we 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 have this vision in our mind of you know what our expectation is, what we want to happen, what we think is going to happen. And we all dream of, you know, that big bull walking in, you know, 10 yards screaming in our face. But to get to that point, you have to, I mean, reality, the reality of the, I mean, the reality of it is, you know, are you, are you putting yourself in the best situation for that to happen? And I think, I think some people just run in there Uh, I mean, me included, will run in there head first, not thinking twice about the wind, and that stuff right. smacks that that bull gets to a hundred yards, starts licking his nose, sticks his head in the air, and then you've lost. Yeah, and you, and you know another thing is that I'd like to touch on is you watch these videos, and all these videos have been cut and edited, yeah, for just for the you know purpose of you know uh production production and you know they make it look easy but you know the the hard truth of it is that they might have 500 hours worth of footage yeah and you know they have cut it down and made this you know great production so the world thinks that what you're doing is something easy and 
I mean, in it reality, easy. it's the farthest <laughs> thing from yeah. easy that you could, you know, you could do. It's yeah, it definitely ain't that. <laughs> no, it's it's uh it's incredibly difficult to kill any mature animal, and I feel like when you take in all the aspects, uh, I honestly feel like killing a mature bull elk is is probably you know going to be one of the hardest things that you'll you'll do. Yeah, and you know. I mean, I'm not even going to sit here and say that I won't kill anything else because, you know, the first bull that with antlers walks in, I'd probably be pretty interested in, in shooting that bad boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and that's the thing. Um, being able to being able to harvest any elk yeah. is is a feat. I mean, you yeah. know, it's it's really one hundred percent agree. And and another thing is, you know, you watch these guys, they've harvested many mature elk, but I would guarantee you at a time they started learning just like us and adding, you know, adding knowledge, gaining knowledge. And I would guarantee you when they started, there was a time when they killed, you know, bulls that were not mature. And well, you know, you look at the bro guys, the uh, born and raised outdoors guys, them guys are probably some of the most seasoned, uh, experienced elk hunters on YouTube. Uh, and I mean, they're extremely good at elk hunting and they kill, I mean, multiple elk every year in, you know, a lot of different states. And I mean, they're not in there killing trophy elk every time, every time they shoot, they shoot. You know, I've seen them shoot uh, little raghorn bulls and stuff. So, I mean, I wouldn't be. I, and they're not ashamed of that. So, why no, should anybody? I mean, why should anybody else? You know. Well, I mean, that's that's another thing. All in, you know, completely another thing because until it, it's easy to sit there, you know, like we was saying earlier, it's easy to think that it's it's easy because of what you see on social media yeah. and everything, yeah. you know, uh, at this point when you've invested all these days and hours and lost sleep over thinking about what you need to be doing when yeah. you get Looking in there, maps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, physically, mentally, you know, spiritually yeah. it's when you get in there just to have the opportunity to harvest any, any bull, yeah. is is just amazing you know and you you can't you can't pass that up and you know i i could see you know passing it up if you know that you're on bigger bulls and i would yeah. be okay with that I, well if, you know you, and the, the difference is like if you're drawing you know a limited entry unit you know in utah or colorado or wyoming or somewhere like that versus we're in an otc unit which is uh, if I'm not mistaken, in a lot of states that that are, you know, elk states, that they're uh, uh, managed off a number and not and not bull quality. You know? Right. Yeah, and I mean that's that's the thing, you know. If if I can't I can't honestly say as bad as I would want to. If if we knew. If we had a you know a younger bull walk up on us and we knew that he was the only bull there, I I would you know there's no there's no chance that we could ever pass that up. But right. if if we did know in fact that there were other bigger bulls in the area, you know I think that we have the maturity to step back and say hey, you know let's let's look at the bigger you know let's look at the bigger picture here can we yeah. can we you know maybe hold out for one more day and yeah, let that let know. that young one get a little bit right and it, you know or... if it doesn't pan out and he presents us another chance then you know absolutely we're gonna we're gonna take it and we're gonna be extremely happy with it that's you know that's just another thing that you've got to cross you know you got to cross that fence when you get to it yeah yeah, and honestly, I, I sit here and say, you know, uh, if a spike walked out in front of me, I, I don't think I would shoot it, and I wouldn't 
honestly, I wouldn't want to shoot it because I want to shoot a branch antler bull because I want, to, I want it on my wall, you know, <laughs> right. but when that spike walks out there in front of me, you know, expectation versus reality comes up again, <laughs> Right. you know, and you know, I mean, people, people are different, you know, I mean, there's, there's people from all walks of life that want to be different things. You know, some people want to be rich and famous. Some people only want to kill a, kill a, you know, a white tail if it's six and a half years old and been through 15 yeah. battles, you know, yeah. they can tell their story about it. You know, some people want to hunt for meat, you know, just, you know, kill anything that they can, you know, some people, you know, to provide for their family or what, you know, whatever it be, you know, there's, there's a place for everybody, you know, in this yeah. world, no matter what you, you know, what you want to do. If you want to, if you want to harvest the spike and, you know, just cause it's the first thing that walks out, then so be it. If you want to wait and harvest a mature bull, you know, so be it. At the end of the day, yeah. you've put in the time and the effort and yeah. whoever else is watching hasn't. So you have to be happy with what you've done personally. Yeah. That's exactly right, man. I'm, uh, and yeah, man, I'm glad you said that. I was, uh, Michael Waddell said something, I guess a couple of years talk, basically talking about the same thing, you know, being proud of, of what you harvest and not caring about what other people say. Um, and I, you know, I really, I really like that and respected uh, him for saying that because, you know, they've got a big show on TV and, and they kill these giant whitetails and giant bulls and all that stuff. But, and he said, he, he feels like, Pretty much, he basically said that the the industry has made everybody feel like they got to be doing that kind of stuff, and and it's not. You know, everybody, anybody can shoot whatever makes them happy, and you know, that's really what it boils down to, is what whatever makes you happy. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and and you know, that's another thing. Like I was just saying, everybody, you know, wants to walk their own walk. You know, I feel like I feel like everybody. Um, I feel like everybody wants that they they want to criticize you for every little mistake that you make, but yeah. they don't want to put themselves in your shoes. Yeah. And well, see what it took with, to get there. With our channel, I mean, our YouTube channel and this podcast or whatever, um, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna put the reel on there. You know, if I if I shoot and wound an animal. You know, I'm going to put that on there, you know, out of respect for the animal and and to not be fake. And people, I'm sure if that happens, people are going to criticize and, you know, talk about, oh, that was a bad shot. You shouldn't have took that that shot or you shouldn't have did this. You shouldn't have done that. But uh, right. them people ain't them people ain't walking in my shoes or your shoes or, you know, whatever yeah, it may be. That's one thing I can honestly say about us. You know, there's people there's people in this world that'll pull up on the side of the road and poach an animal and that, you know, stuff like that disgusts me. I, I can honestly say about us and I truly believe this when I say it, we are true, genuine outdoorsmen. Yeah. I, agree. I, I could not, I could not sleep with myself at night if I knew that I was, you know, doing something wrong or if I was uh, leading people on, yeah. you know, telling, you know, showing them all the good and not showing them the bad, because that's not how it's supposed to be. You know, yeah. people people make mistakes every day in life, whether it's your job or your, your personal life. You know, you're going to have it. Nobody's perfect and people are going to criticize you no matter what. But I can sleep better at night knowing if. I yeah, shot we did. an animal and, and had to, you know, tell somebody, Hey, you know, I, I made a bad shot or, you know, something, you know, something hunting, went wrong. Bow hunting and even gun hunting. I've seen it. Um, I personally had it happen. Uh, it's, it's just going to happen. It's a part of hunting every, you know, sometimes it's, it's not going to line up the way you want it to. Yeah. I mean, it's not something, it's not something that's well, what people don't understand is, and, you know, and, and that's another thing. People that don't care, they, they'll they shoot an animal. They don't find it. They'll look for 20 or 30 minutes and, you know, forget it. I guess he's a, a goner, you know. Yeah. We we put in the time. We would we would search for hours you yeah, know, how or, long or, or days until we know that we've exhausted 
everything that we could. And I feel like that's something that's going to help us be successful because we're both humble. We're both humble people and we're both very, very driven and respectful to, to nature. And I feel like that's something that'll really help us, you know, as we, as we get farther into this stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, on, on your side of it, what, uh, what are your goals for, for next year for the elk hunt in 2022? You know, honestly, I really, I, I really think that we can get on, um, get on more animals, more bulls or more, yeah. you know, just herds of elk in general. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, my, my main goal obviously is, is to harvest, you know, to harvest the bull elk. Um, but at the same time, you know, this isn't just one of those things, you know, it's not like taking a, a once in a lifetime trip. You know, this right. is something that we're going to be able to continue to do for years to come and learn from each time. My, my main goal is just to get back out there and to gather as much knowledge as we can and just yeah. bring it back home, whether we harvest or not. I think we need to learn as much as we can. That way, you know, we can just make a mental note of it. Hey we did this wrong or, Hey, I think we could have did this better. And, you know, ultimately I, I hope that, you know, in the, in the week or two weeks that we have, you know, depending on how long we can, you know, take off of work, hopefully we can pattern it out and, you know, sort it all out in that, in that time period and, you know, get the job done. But if we don't, you know, it's still not a loss. It's, it's right. it's a gain it's a gain it's a positive no matter what yeah i think uh for my for my side of it i think for me uh obviously uh the the top goal would be to actually kill a bull but i think um my goal that's that's as important as that uh maybe just below that is is to gain the experience from being out there, um, right. try to gain knowledge, uh, whatever, whatever unit we go to or whatever areas we go to, to try to learn the unit a little bit and then to try to, uh, uh, get, get experience interacting with elk. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing, you know, that's another thing we haven't really talked about a whole lot is we need, uh, to to figure out you know we we know what a what a white tail is going but yeah anyways i think another thing you know that we've got to get better at or you know not necessarily get better at because we don't have as much experience you know there's not we can get better from last year but you know there's you, you can't get you know a whole lot better when you haven't, ex, you know, had a lot of experience. So I think right. one thing that we could really do is learn the patterns of elk behavior better, you know, as far as elevations and seasons, you know, we need to really figure out, you know, ballpark of where we think the elevation, you know, that they might be at, at that time of year in early September yeah, and you know that's something that I was I've been trying to kind of look at like on people's videos and uh, when other or when other people are talking and reading articles and stuff like that when when elk start becoming more active like ruddy and when they start moving at, at different elevations and stuff like that and mm -hmm. I know you know multiple people have said around September 12th in the Colorado. In the I guess the central Colorado area, September twelfth is is usually when stuff starts getting getting kind of on fire. Right. Yeah, and I, I mean, honestly, I think that you know us being us being you know archery um, early season, I think that actually it gives you a disadvantage, 
you know, because anybody will tell you that it's it's much harder to harvest a mature animal with a bow than it is with a with a rifle or a muzzle loader. And but I do think it gives us the advantage in the fact that those animals haven't been pressured so bad yet early in the season. Yeah. And I think that'll really really be another thing that helps us out as we as we move forward. Well, I guess that's all we got for today, Don Will. <clears throat> we'll uh we'll be getting back to it here pretty soon, I guess. Uh, I know you and you and Lauren are gonna have a good night tonight at the uh hot air balloon festival. Hope y'all have a good time, man. All right, brother. It was good talking to you. Until next time. All right. Peace out. See you, bud. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. And if you like what you heard, you can follow us on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, You can go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Also, whatever streaming platform uh, you listen to us on, you can follow us on there. So you can stay in tune when we put new episodes out. Thanks for listening, guys. Y'all have a good day. Always remember, love God, love people. Work hard and outwork the competition.